let, let's jump into the weeds of that first chapter because I <laughs> yeah, think sure. that this is, you're right, the people use these terms all around, clubrids, clubroids, and maybe mm-hmm. don't fully understand it. I definitely didn't fully understand it until I was reading that chapter. I'm like, oh my God. That first chapter is like an emotional <laughs> roller coaster because I was kind of taking notes <laughs> and then I was like, oh, this is how it's classified. And I'm like, nope, the next paragraph deletes mm-hmm. all that. Okay, so do it again. And then I would write it. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to read the whole chapter before taking notes. <laughs> but why don't we start with just the mess of clubrids, kind of how that began and Mm -hmm. sort of what Kluber's originated as and why it became so messy so quickly. Yes. So a a fun fact for people listening is the the family Kluberdi uh, was initially described by a guy named Bonaparte. If there's any birders listening to this, you're going to recognize Bonaparte immediately because there is a gall, Bonaparte's gall, that occurs throughout the Great Lakes region and along the Atlantic coast. Uh, But Bonaparte was a, a, a relatively famous French naturalist. And, and, and back in the 1800s, it was kind of a it, it was a fun it was a practice of the biologists of the day to just kind of grab on to any group that somebody hadn't necessarily described using our good friend Linnaeus's new framework for describing things with binomial nomenclature and all of that. And then you know, write a, a quick paper, publish it and basically establish yourself as the the guy that did the initial taxonomy. And so Bonaparte looked at a bunch of snakes, realized that there's a whole bunch of snakes in particular in Europe that are not obviously venomous. Um, They don't have a viper like body plan. They don't look like a bow or a Python. And so he basically stated, these are the typical snakes and then came up with the word Calubra, which comes from the Latin, which literally translates from to snake. And so that's where it's a great family name for the Calubridae because they are, forever been known as the typical snakes or the classic snakes or whatever you want to call it. And, and then, you know, from there, it it, it 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 starts with typical snakes. Well, think about all of the snakes that can <laughs> fall under this moniker of typical. I mean, it's insane. It's everything from Natrix, which are grass snakes, up to like dice snakes, to Montpelier snake. I'm thinking about animals in Europe. And so it was very common at that point in time to assume snakes aren't overly complicated. They're a head, a neck, a body, and a tail. So we're just going to basically put all these nondescript snakes under this family colubridae. And and that's what happened until people figured out how to actually differentiate them beyond fat, venomous snake, skinny, non-venomous snake. And that was where you kind of get into male genital anatomy. If you're going to, if you aspire to be a snake taxonomist, you better prepare yourself for looking at an awful lot of hemipenes because yeah. the hemipene anatomy is is where you get the, the the real differentiation at a family and genus level. And so the guy who starts to kind of figure that out is is a guy named Cope, who was a paleontologist. Um, if you know about the Bone Wars, which is kind of a famous thing in dinosaur paleontology, Cope was that guy. Cope was a character. And so he's the guy that kind of starts looking and realizes – yeah, there's some some differentiation going on with the, with the genitals here, and and he takes that and and runs with it, and he's actually the guy that realizes that colubrids uh, are probably multiple lineages, which basically means that there's all kinds of diversity herein, uh, and then from that, you know, that's when the arguments start. Is it more? conservative and we have colubridae with all these subgroups underneath it or are these subgroups actually their own families and they deserve to be recognized as such and Mm -hmm. and teasing that whole thing out in a chronology from random bits of information was a lot of fun and at the same time really hard (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So, yeah. One thing when I'm reading it, and, and this is the same sort of feeling I get when I read other works of you know Linnaeus or anybody who's describing species in those early days, I just don't understand how those people had were able to expose themselves to such a, a large volume of animals. You know, like wh- I yes. don't even know if like do you know how that works? Like what yeah. what the hell? Oh are yeah, doing? no, this is what they were doing. They were relying on the Victorian biologists the the. The field people, basically, in the 1800s were were all over the world. So what was happening in the Victorian era is you had these natural history centers or hubs. And they were all the natural history museums. So you have the London Natural History Museum, the Paris Museum of Natural History. There were natural history museums in Spain. 
Uh, and at the time, the American Museum of Natural History and the National Museum of Natural History and even things like my local museum, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, they're sending out naturalists, biologists, and they're, they're going out into the world and they're basically grabbing as many animals as possible, um, dispatching them, preserving them, and then they're shipping them back to the museum. Mm -hmm. And so the way that these biologists get their hands on all these specimens from all over the place is that process. Uh, and, and so, you know, somebody sitting in New York City at the American Museum of Natural History, they can be receiving boxes on a weekly basis from Suriname, Guyana, Costa Rica, Mexico, Arizona. And so they're basically receiving this stuff and then feverishly trying to write and get it described before the next guy gets it described. And, and what that environment did is it basically, it made for a, an environment where you're going to do some somewhat sloppy science because you want to get your paper out first and get your names out first so that your names are the names that are recognized ultimately. Right. And so that's part of the process. Now, fortunately, today, we don't really do things that way. <laughs> um, we still use those specimens that were collected in the 1800s um, in the early 1900s. But, you know, today, if you're going to be describing a, a, a taxa, it's almost certainly going to involve a, a DNA component. And you're going to be you know, adding a lot of objectivity into the mix. Yeah. So it's, it's a very different process today than it was back then. Yeah, it's it, it, it really fascinating. I mean, it, it, A... The it's it interesting in that chapter watching it kind of refine as we move mm -hmm. through time, which is really cool. I mean, that is what science is. You start with this kind yep. of gross idea, and then it sort of becomes more specific, which is really cool. But you know, you'd already mentioned the hemipenes, and that that <laughs> sort of reiterated quite often in that first chapter. And I, I kept I like I kept wondering why what in that piece of anatomy do they decide to throw higher in the hierarchy when it comes to differentiating <laughs> species? Is I mean, maybe the hemipenes has a you know it. I, I don't know. Like, I mean, I'm sure it happens oh. in crayfish all the time too, right? No, there, there's a form of speciation in zoology that zoologists under you know, have, have defined and described. And we refer to it as lock and key speciation. The um, male genitalia is the, is the, is the key to the lock, which is the female genitalia. So there's a whole myriad of animals where they're, the bodies of the animals between species look really similar, but the way that they're able to differentiate each other at a species level is the male genitals of one species don't fit into the female genital genital tract of another species. So this lock and key speciation mechanism is important, and snakes have undergone that to a certain degree. It's, it's not as extreme as what you see in many species of arthropods, but at the same time, uh, the hemipenal structures are super important. And so... Early on, herpetologists figured this out. And even to this day, when you describe a new species of snake, if you read those descriptions, there's going to be a description of the male hemipene because it's it it, it has proven out with genetics uh, oftentimes to be taxonomically significant. Mm. And so, a pretty easy visual cue to, mm -hmm. to look at. Yes. So so let's talk a little bit about your the sort of that lumper versus splitter mm -hmm. as, as far. So as of right now, is it still contentious or is it is the way it is? I guess it always is. It is definitely still contentious. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm not going to name any kind of names. There are people that would read that first chapter that I wrote in herpetological circles, and they would basically be, be saying, oh, my gosh, yes, yes, yes. There are going to be scientists that read that chapter and basically say, what the hell is he talking about? Absolutely not. And that's just something that you you – I have to accept. So what I did is I just read all the evidence. I picked a, a, a path or a lane, and that's the lane I stayed in uh, throughout. It's important for people to know uh, if people were to interpret the results or the papers differently than I did, they might come up with a different conclusion. Um, my ultimate conclusion was I felt like there was ample evidence, but primarily genetic evidence that supported there being multiple, many of these, pri these uh, these taxons that were prior to you know the molecular evolution, given subspecific status, now we're we're kind of recognizing them as as families, and and the main reason for that is with the DNA work, if you you create a, a phylogenetic tree, 
and I put a couple of phylogenetic trees in there for people to see. Mm -hmm. if, if, if all these organisms kind of come back to one spot on a greater tree of life for snakes, they form what we call a monophyletic group. And if you have a monophyletic group, that implies a unique lineage, which basically implies that all these animals have a common ancestor. And so, you know, there's ample evidence as far as I'm concerned that clearly demonstrates that the dipsatids have one kind of common ancestral group uh, and they radiate out from there. Just like with uh, garter snakes, water snakes, grass snakes, keelbacks, we call those animals natricids. Uh, there's quite a few herpetologists now that recognize the family natricidae. Uh, back in the day, it would have been natricinae, a subfamily underneath the family colubridae. So, right. you know, we're, we're basically kind of moving forward with that. So do you think the family colubridae will slowly disconnect itself into being almost nothing? Because as, as of right now, we have, the, you know, we have this sort of super family of colubroid, yeah. which has everything underneath it. But it sounds mm -hmm. like things are slowly being snapped off the colubrid yes. family into their own um, families. The, the family colubridae, I think, will, will absolutely stand the test of time. Uh, there are several anatomical or morphological attributes that that particular group of snakes have. Uh, many of them completely lack a Duvernoy's gland, um, which is the kind of infamous gland that equates to a venom gland in the dipsatid snakes. Uh, many of them have unique vertebrae anatomy, lung anatomy. They all kind of, many of them, not all, but most fulfill a similar ecological niche. They're rodentivorous, bird-eating um, large constricting colubrids and, and the genetic evidence, this, you know, absolutely supports them having monophyly. So mm -hmm. things like rat snakes, milk snakes, king snakes, um, the spyloides, rat snakes, all of those guys. And then a whole uh, dry Markin, the indigo snakes and Krebos, you know, all of them kind of form a, a really nice monophyletic group. Mm -hmm. But what, what it comes down to is just how you interpret the data. Uh, and there will always be subjectivity in this. We can never get it completely to an objective manner because a lot of times what many people don't realize with the phylogenetic trees is that you as a researcher, you have to pick a model that that tree is going to basically be created from. And there are some models that are very, that are going to create very conservative results, which are going to glump everybody together. And that would be kind of like a lumper model. And then there's other models of evolution that are going to split things way out that would be a splitters model. And then there's a whole bunch of models that are kind of intermediate. Uh, and that's where the peer review process and herpetology comes into play uh, to kind of keep everybody honest and, 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 you know, agree upon. But I have found what's interesting about my history taxonomically is I started off a hard core lumper. I was as lump. Uh, I, I did. I did not understand why things were being split as much as they are. Then I actually was forced into the world of systematics and taxonomy with all the descriptions I've done with crayfish um, and learned an awful lot about the process and the lines of evidence. And I wouldn't say that I'm a splitter, but if I had to pick a camp, I kind of lean a little bit more towards the world being more biologically diverse than we previously thought. Mm -hmm. So so this is definitely a book that kind of takes a splitting argument, I would argue. Yeah, uh, but but I don't dive you know headfirst into that. So and so for the listeners, that is just the dipsatids were an initially just a subfamily under colubrids, and the way that you presented yes. the book is that there's enough information ge genetically, geographically, and morphologically to actually yep. bring them up to the family level, and then have subfamilies underneath it, which is when we start to bring in the xenodont today. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, for me personally, like I. I couldn't, I don't think I have the personality to be a lumper because I just like things to be in categories, you know, like yeah. things that are just different. It's like, that's a different thing. There's just enough, <laughs> yeah. of, enough of a change. So maybe mm -hmm. you could 